Welcome, everybody. We are in the Masilis Uh We're using this book, the Feldheim edition, but you can use any book. They're all the same. Uh, when the Right at the end of chapter 23 on how to acquire humility. And uh, if you're in this book, it's on the bottom of page 165, the last paragraph. We're talking about the things that detract from another, from humility. Okay, so the first one is Achmaf Sidi, and this is talking about the first man. Achmaf Sidi Amidia Zod, who reboy receiver but to vote all of us. The things that subtract from uh, another humility is, um, let me translate it, there's usually in translate extravagance and overindulgence regarding the good things of this world. Um, yeah, uh, that's a good enough translation. So, so as as uh, the, it's, it brings down a pasuk, so it will happen, so that it will not happen, you will eat and be satisfied, that you become, turning the page, conce conceited. Uh, for this reason, those who are pious have found that it is beneficial for a person to sometimes afflict himself in order to humble the evil inclination of haughtiness, since it only succeeds in strengthening itself through success. This is similar to what they of blessed memory have said in the Gemara and Brachas, a lion does not roar over a basket of straw, uh, but over a basket of meat. What? So, <laughs> what? No one prides themselves, in other words, over having a 30-year-old car that can barely get, you know, 25 miles an hour. Um, on the freeway going downhill with a good wind behind it, right? It's like having the, a brand new Maserati, you know. It, that's what really you know picks people's arrogance up. Not that, not that anyone here would know. I, I, I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> not me either. Right. Oh, so, so you're saying the whole concept of the lion roaring is really the Itzahara, like roaring with haughtiness, because right. you have something to roar about. Thanks of all about exactly right. There's a famous say, say, saying statement by Winston Churchill, where he was talking to a friend about another friend, and one of them <laughs> said, "The third friend is very humble." And Winston Churchill said, "Well, he has a lot to be humble about." <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> I've heard that. That yeah, sounds bad. like Winston Churchill, actually. Right, right. Seems a little arrogant, doesn't it? A little bit, yeah. That's just a little he bit. was arrogant. He was arrogant, exactly. I wonder what he was like, really, just in person. If you got to sat down and sit down and talk to him, anyway. <laughs> so, um, where was I? Oh, so this is the first man. So the first man is is in some degree of self-deprecation. Now he had, the the Ram Collins said pre in the, previously that a lot of these things of practices of humility are antithetical to Hasidus. Um, uh, he said that even though sometimes they can be useful as aids, but to think that this is the path by which you're going to achieve, in this case, humility, is a, is a big mistake. In other words, who, who uses these things is somebody who is... is um, uh, finds themselves caught up in the excesses of life. You know, there, there's many stories. I mean, King Solomon himself, but great rabbis who lived a, a tremendously ostentatious lives had all the, the, the niceties of life, right? A king in Jewish law has to be a wealthy person. He's not allowed to look uh, uh, um, dep deprived or anything like that. He has to live with. Now we've got a famous statement of, of uh, the great rabbis who had uh, all the, you know, their tables were filled with the best food constantly. So, so what is he talking about? He's talking about the first man that it goes to his head. In other words, all, all the pleasures of this life is very interesting. The, one of the differences between the Ashkenazic benching, grace after meals, and the Sephardic benching is there's a line in the Sephardic bench is taken from Navi that says that we bless God for what is left over. 
the Ashkenazim mm-hmm. don't say this. Right? It's a very, it's a very sweet, very touching. Uh, it's based on a story with the uh, uh, the the uh, um, uh, I believe it was either Eliyahu or Elisha. I think it was Eliyahu, but I'm not sure. But uh, there was they, they they had so much food it was left over after a famine, and that was a sign that the Almighty is on their side. In other words, what why do you need leftover food? Like, you should you should you know the famous story the Gemara says that Reish Lakish would would end the day ha- having no funds left. He would work as much as he needed, and then by the end of the day he was broke. He had no money left. And the next day he woke up, the Almighty will take care of him. That's definitely a way to live. Um, but we would find it very difficult today to live like that. But uh, Rev, uh, Rev, um, what's his name, Roy Belsky, he tells the story, I believe it's his father-in-law. This was one time, they, he wasn't in shul, he wasn't in yeshiva, they couldn't find him, right? And eventually they find him in the middle of the street like besides himself, blabbering on like he's like a madman. And they finally get him to calm down. And they ask him, what's the matter? What's the matter? He says, I've lost my chilek in Olam Haba. How? Oh. I don't have a portion in the next world anymore. Oh. Okay. Right? So, so, so how do you know? I mean, it's, it was a, it's, it was a big subject. How do you know? He says, my whole life, I only ever had enough money for that month's rent. This week, I got enough money for two months' rent. <laughs> Obviously, the Almighty is pay- paying me for my my uh, my mitzvahs in this world. In other words, the uh-huh. Rishon, the evil, they get their reward, their schar in this world, not in the next world. So he said, I must be getting it in this world. So does that mean we shouldn't be rewarded in this world? 100%. You don't want a reward for your mitzvahs in this world. 100%. But doesn't it say uh, in the Elu Devarim Shalem Shiur that your reward, you, you get a principle and a reward? Yeah, you get you get the Karen is in Olam Abab, but the fruit is in this world. But it's not the, the principle. You don't you don't eat the principle. It's like having it's like having ten million dollars in the bank, right? They send you, which is very nice, you know. <laughs> they send you a check every month, every month for I don't know what the interest rate would be, whatever it would get. Right? They, let's say they send you a check for thousand dollars every every month. That's, that's the print. That's that's the interest. It's not interest. the principle. They don't you don't eat into the principle. So couldn't that be just the interest? That he's getting? Yeah, the, the, he thought it was the principle now. Like, why do I, I don't need to uh, work? Spirits. Why is he <laughs> why giving me this? I don't, I don't have to worry anymore. Oh, he's giving me my skull in this world. I mean, I'm not, I'm, 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 uh, he's living on a different level than me. Yeah, it's really hard to, I mean, I'm really trying very hard to relate to what he's saying, but it's very difficult because that's like, it's just two months rent. Like most of us have been like brainwashed with, okay, you need to make sure that you've saved at least six months worth in case you lose your job. And yeah. Yeah. I don't know what he's talking about. Right, right. So in case, in case you lose your job, right. And the almighty isn't taking care of you anymore. <laughs> so, so, right. Like I'm saying, yeah. we've been brainwashed. Well, right? I'd like to think that God the almighty's... not taking care of us. Right. Exactly. Right. I'd like to think the Almighty is always taking care of me. Right. I may, I, I, it may be in ways I don't completely comprehend. Right, right. But, but what do you need? You what, what do you need six months rent for then? He's always taking uh, care. to make his job easier. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking out for God. Right, exactly. A lot of things on his mind. There's billions of people on the on the planet. Right, let me take a, right, just say, be on the earth. Put 25 million in my account, and, uh, so he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to check the books next week. I know, but isn't is when you're like, um, I don't know, earning your own rent or whatever you're doing. 
isn't that you doing your part and not, I mean, you're not supposed to, you also have a part to do. And if you're not doing at least that much, you know, one or two months rent or whatever it is we're talking about here, or enough to buy your dinner so that you're full. I mean, does that mean you're not doing your part? Well, you see, we live in an, in an economy that it's very hard to live on a day-to-day -day basis. In the good old days when you would, I don't know, you uh, uh, I don't know, you you clean windows for a living. This is something simple, right? So how many windows do you clean? I, I need a a hundred dollars today, right, to eat. So I clean four windows and uh, I'm done. What do I need more money than that for? It was a famous, there's a famous uh, uh, apocryphal story of uh, Henry Ford goes fishing. It's very apropos. So he goes to, he goes fishing. Like Henry Ford was a bit of a workaholic, if not an absolute workaholic. I don't really know. And but an anti-Semite. And an anti-Semite on top of it. So he's, he goes to, he goes fishing. The doctor said you gotta relax. So he goes fishing. So he's up the next and he's fishing and he's not really doing very well. And he sees a guy just a little further down. And every 15 minutes he's bringing in another another trout, another mackerel another whatever big significant fish and he's like blown away after about two hours of this the guy packs up his bags and goes home and uh, henry ford can't help himself he runs out of his other guy and says uh I, I gotta ask you a question like why are you going home is the day still young he says i've caught enough fish for this week i'll come back next week he says you're coming back next week why don't you come back tomorrow? He says, I, I don't need any more fish for tomorrow. I've got enough for the week. He says, that's crazy. You should fish tomorrow. He says, what would I do with the extra fish? He says, well, you, you, you save it up. You go sell them, right? Eventually, you can get two or three rods, and then you can give them more. He says, what do I do with the extra fish? Well, then you get a little boat, and you keep fishing, fishing, and then you get a trawler, right? You go out to the big ocean, catch the big fish, and then you get... You know, uh, th th then you can, you know, hire people and you can have a little little uh, fleet of boats and catch lots and lots of fish and make lots and lots of money. He says, and then what will you do? What, what will I do then? He says, well, then you can retire and do whatever you want. He says, I'm doing that now. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever met, and you have met a lot of wealthy people, have you ever met any who say they have enough? I, I used to ask them this question all the time. When I first started in the rabbi business, I used to ask this question all the time until I realized it wasn't getting me anywhere. I used to say to them, do you have enough money so you could liquidate all your assets and live the rest of your life in the standard of living you live now? And invariably, they would say yes. So then I would ask them, so why are you doing it then? And most of the time, they didn't have an answer. One guy once said to me, really nice guy he said i don't know what i would do with myself being honest i don't know what i would do with myself you know they're like they, 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 you know Rav Narki always used to say are you living you're eating to live or living to eat most people are living to eat they just they just want to eat they're, they're not eating to live they've got nothing they want to live for there's nothing in their life that worth living for but that's not the first man. The first man, the, the, the extravagance gets to him. So he, he has to um, limit those things. That, 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 that's, that's what we're talking about, is that the first man, it goes, to, it goes to his head. It becomes arrogant because he thinks he's a big shot because he's got a Lamborghini in the front, uh, uh, in the, you know, you know, you all heard my my Bentley story, right? You always know the Bentley story. Sure, uh, but go uh, ahead. <laughs> I was in Los Angeles many years ago, and uh, walking along the street, and it's just when the new Bentleys came out. It used to be Bentley and Rolls Royce with the same car, like 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 a, a, a Buick and a Cadillac, and then they separated them out. But Bentleys became Bentleys, and Rolls Royces became Rolls Royces. And um, the Snoop Bentley came out. It was a fantastic car. And uh, I'm walking along, and this Bentley, brand new Bentley, cuts me off. I'm coming home from Shabbos, from Shul and Shabbos. And I look at the car, I go, oh, that's a nice car. 
and uh, start ogling the car. And out of the back of the car comes one of my students. And I said to him, what is his name? I forget his name now. Uh, Barry, Barry. I said, Barry, what are you doing here? Right? So he says, oh, we're just going into Stellini's. <laughs> Italian restaurant. I said, I don't know, that was kosher. He says, yeah, 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 yeah. They were joking around, right? So the guy who was driving the car said to Barry, he says, who is that guy? He says, oh, that's my rabbi. This rabbi is more like a stand-up comedian. He says, yeah. But anyway, long story short, right, <laughs> the guy who was the driver started learning too. Right? So I called Rav Nauch up, and it bothered me because there's a concept in Judaism, a mitzvah bar minute, a mitzvah goreves mitzvah, a vera goreves vera. And there's no mitzvah that comes out of an avera. You, you can't do an avera and a mitzvah will come out of it. You can't steal money and give tzedakah. It doesn't work. Right? So here I was. I was ogling a Bentley. And now from there, I, I get this guy to learn. So I called Rav Nauch. He bothered me. I called him and I said, I, I need to ask you a question. Right? In those days, you could call him up and you get through. It was a great, a, a different world. And... Um, I need to call you, I need to ask you a question, but before I ask you a question, I need to ask you another question. Do you know what a Bentley is? <laughs> you know, I was see a picture of Bev Nach. He didn't look like the kind of guy who like, knew what a Bentley was. He says, sure. And if you ever get one, get one for me too. <laughs> right? This world is meant to be enjoyed. The pleasures of this world are here to be enjoyed. You gotta figure out what, what there's a pleasure in a Bentley, right? You gotta enjoy it. Now, if you think that the Bentley makes you a better person, if you think that the Bentley makes you an important person, right? Ooh, now you're in trouble. That's what that's what he's talking about. Right? The the, the abundance of this world can make you think that way. You can't think that way if you're broke. Right? All poor people are honors, are humble, by by definition. Uh, uh, I used to know this guy. He ended up in federal prison. So uh, so I went to visit him. Right, While he was in prison, he was the nicest guy. <laughs> we, we used to do this program called Bliss. We still do it, right? It's the marriage program. So we got a federal grant at one point. So uh, the, the federal government was actually very good in certain areas. And one of the things they do is they would introduce us to people to cut, doing cutting re research in the fields that we were in. So they had this presenter once. We'd have these conferences. We had this presenter once who um, was um, researching why inner city women ha have babies. Like there's, there's, a, there's a big problem because these inner city women have, are having these babies and it's a big drain on society because they, they need welfare, they're completely, they're completely uh, uh, can't take care of themselves, can't take care of the babies. And it's a cycle of craziness going on because they raise these kids, they don't know what they're doing. So, so she was telling us that one of the issues is of these women who marry inmates in prison. <laughs> they, they never knew them beforehand, but they marry them, you know, while they're in prison, right? And I, was, and I couldn't get wrap my head around it. Like, why are people doing this? Why are these women doing this? So she said, what happens is there's a, a guy in prison and he's married. So his wife comes and visits. And uh, while she's there, she talks to his friend. And his friend's a nice guy. He says, she says to him, you know, I've got a friend who never got married. And uh, you should meet her. So she comes and visits. And, you know, one thing leads to another. Right? She marries this guy. Right? This is the new Shidduch program? Yeah, new Shidduch program. <laughs> So I said, like, what are these women stupid? Like, what are like, the guys? And, and the problem is, these guys get out of prison and they're terrible people. That's why they're in prison, generally. Not everyone, but a lot, right? And so I said, you know, 
it's a it's a very interesting uh, YouTube. Uh, I think he's got his own channel about this guy who's in prison, and he converts, and he marries one of the people who's the office staff, Jewish girl, and she he marries her, and he becomes this fun guy. You just you just see him. He's it's like really nice, nice guy, right? You have to see the video. I, don't know, I can't remember his name. Um, so anyway, and it seems to be like a genuine convert. It's a very interesting story. So um, so why do they marry these guys? Because so, she, so I said, what are these women stupid? She said, no. He said, why are these guys who are in prison? They're the nicest guys. You can't. Uh, they're humble. Guys. What's that? Because they're humble while they're in prison. They're humble while they're in prison. While they're in prison, they gotta be nice. Because you can't get anywhere if you're not nice in prison. You, you know, you, if you, you, it's not gonna help you. And they probably <laughs> appreciate the woman visiting while right. they're in prison. Right. Once they're out, right. they're like, hey, don't need her anymore. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. We follow. So oh, well, this strange psychology, Rabbi. There must that? be a study of those kind of marriages and what happened. Yeah, that's what this woman was doing. She was doing, uh, that's, that was what she was doing. She was studying these relationships. That's a big problem. It's a big problem. So anyway, getting back, well, we, we really got off topic here. Um, da, 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 da. We're up to second man, I think. No, still in the first man. No, so, he's still, still in the first. first. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Um, so, so, um, uh, oh no, you're right. The second man, right? The, you're right. The second man. So that that's the first man, right? The 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 abundance of this world can really get to your head. Very dangerous, right? That's the first man, and you see that in the in the world. That uh, um, you, you know, there's nothing like your wealth to create immense stupidity. People think they know everything, and they know how to do everything. And part of the reason why we have so many problems is this teaching us we don't know what we're doing. It's a, it's a humbling experience. You see what's going on to October 7th. How did you get in such a mess? Because you thought you knew what you're doing. I so, thought you were going to tell the lottery story. What's the lottery story? About uh, how people who win the lottery and win millions and millions of dollars and their life goes to hell. Yeah, yeah, right. So that's the same. That's exactly the point, right? Same, the same exact idea, right? The same idea. So now the second one, the barosh column of Sidim, who is sick, loose, and meat loose for your dear the 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 second man, which is all about the second man, is you have a job to do. So. You know, if you if you have a job to do, let's say your uh, your job is um, uh, uh, drive the trains or fly a plane or a chef or whatever it happens to be. Well, well, the only thing that counts is are you doing your job? The car you drive, the clothes you wear, the house you live in. All these things are really irrelevant. If if you are in the army, let's say. And uh, your job is, you know, uh, um, you know, watching out for incoming missiles or whatever it happened to be. Nothing else is important if unless you're doing your job. Everything else is irrelevant. So that's the second man. When you know, when you have the true knowledge, because most people don't know what this what, what they're supposed to be doing, so they don't have the true knowledge, the knowledge of Torah which is trying to help you. Torah is about trying to help you fulfill your mission in life. It's not just reading random things and uh, 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 nice, cute stories and things like that. It's it's instruction, as Rav Nock always used to say, Torah's time is instructions for living. He's teaching you how to live. So are you living the, the, the best you, should, you could possibly be? You know, it's the famous story I think it's Rav Zusha sitting on his deathbed and he's crying and his students are say, saying to him, what, what, what are you crying about? You have such a remarkable life. 
you have achieved so much. Are you crying because you maybe one as great as Moshe Rabbeinu? He says, no. Are you crying because you one as great as the Rambam? He says, no. He says, well, what are you crying? He says, maybe I'm not as great as Rav Zusha. I, I, I didn't achieve what I should have achieved. Right? We all look at ourselves, me included, or me especially, and go, well, I'm better you know, than a lot of other people. Right? It's a big problem for Balchuvas, by the way. Because we look at ourselves and go, well, I'm doing better than a lot of my relatives and most of my friends, right? So compared to them, I'm I'm way ahead of the game. <laughs> yeah, are we going to need some supplies? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... What should we be? We should instead be thinking... As we, should as be, as we should be thinking as a Yechil, right, who's, who, who, who saved North America and, um, and uh, played the, you know, who, who raised the son to be the Mashiach. And, oh, my uh, gosh. Please don't go there. I have a kid who thinks that for, for a short period of time, he thought that maybe he was the Mashiach. He was petrified about this. I'm like, you're not the Mashiach. Don't worry about it. He's like always worried and concerned about it. maybe he's the Mashiach. What is the Mashiach supposed to do? Like he was like seriously worried about it. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it doesn't take not much. to digress, but I, I just have to ask, what could have triggered that? I really don't know, but like I do like to talk about Mashiach. Like, you know, I, I yeah. do do that. But this is before I became so gung ho about it. I would occasionally talk about it, but I think he's this, the type of person that, like, you know, takes responsibilities very seriously. Like I would tell him as well, he's growing up, good. he's a defender, protector, and then he's going to grow up and he's going to defend and protect people because he has certain strong qualities that, if used inappropriately, could seem negative. So I tried to like focus him on the positive aspects of his of his personality. So maybe that might have, you know, led him to believe that perhaps the defender protector is like a Mashiach. I don't really don't know. Right. Like I would, him to Moshe. I would put him, maybe, to, compare him to Moshe. And maybe he is the Mashiach. God help us. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great kid. I'm going to get a big fat zero. <laughs> He's a great kid. He's a good kid, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> What's wrong with him being a Mashiach? I don't have a problem with it. Yeah, but I, I'm not a mother of a Mashiach. I'm so sorry to tell you. <laughs> well, what do you think the mother of Mashiach is going to be like, you know? I, I they, think she's yeah, a little they bit... never talk about her, really. Is that? Yeah. I mean, you'd hear about, you know, we all pray for the Mashiach to come. But they never say we pray for the mother of the Mashiach to come so she'll give birth to the Mashiach. Yeah. Right. Well, I think there's supposed to be some very specific criteria about Tuma and whatever. I don't but know. But if not, if not you, who? Yeah, why not? I can think of many candidates. <laughs> How do you know Yaakov maybe is the Mashiach? We don't know. Okay, yeah, but the, the, the point is the point is there's a model of what we could be. And I know for sure I'm falling way, 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 way short of that. So when we when we compare ourselves to other people, we tend to pick the people who are lesser than us. And and that's a big mistake. So we think we're we're doing good. Naughty, naughty, not a good idea, right? That's the that, that's the that's the um, uh, that's the stupidity that is talking. Sickles your tet. Rabbeinu Zichron Abachamu, Simon Legasa Ruach, and Nias Batora, the Nias What what is a good sign of arrogance? Somebody who doesn't know Torah, <laughs> you know, a little Torah. <laughs> You know, right? There's there's no mitzvah in the Torah that you can ever say you finished it. You can always do everything better, which is a very important idea. It's like the same thing as children. You can never say I did that perfectly. You could always do it better. 
Anything meaningful could always be improved on. Well, I'm not, I'm not clear on what, what, what's going on with the second man. I thought you said the second man is the one that says, okay, you have a job to do and everything is relevant. Are you saying that these are the, the concerns that if the second man uh, uh, fails in these areas, then he's failing in, the, in his perspective? In other words, if he's not learning Torah, then he's going to be ignorant and then he can't do his job. And so that's going to take away from his being humble. No, it's 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 not that he can't. He, he's if he doesn't. Um, it's not that if he um, he's not doing his job, he's aware of how how lacking he is in fulfilling his job. Is that making sense? Oh, so he's just aware that perhaps he's not doing his job as best as possible mm. and that awareness comes from learning Torah. Right. Ah, thank you for clarifying. There's like a doctor, a, a surgeon, right? A good surgeon isn't, isn't proud of his work because he doesn't know if he could have done it better. You know, how do you know this was the best it could possibly be? You know, yeah, the guy walked out, but maybe if I had, if I had, you know, spent, done this instead of that, he would have more energy or live longer or all kinds of other things. You, you don't know what is, what, see, medicine is, you're dealing with something where you don't know what perfect is. So you don't know if you're giving them the best medication, if this is the right thing to do. So it creates a tremendous another. I hope I, this is the best information I have. Like when they say you should take two of these, right? Because for this condition, but maybe this person needs three. And they're testing it on people. They're not, you know, they're getting an average. And then it doesn't include all the other medications that the person might be and the age of the person, all kinds of other. I'm not saying you, you're making a mistake. It's just, you, you, you're following the guidelines for which you're given, but you never know if you're really doing the best you could possibly do. The same thing for any human being. Uh, are we talking to our children? Are we talking to our spouses the best we could possibly do? Are we talking to ourselves the best we could possibly do? Could I've got up 10 minutes early and learn a little more? Did staying up later do me better or worse? We, we're dealing with so many variables of of, of ignorance we have no idea what we're doing so why why do you say that uh we're here to strive for perfection yeah that's right exactly we are but for the, the, the striving for perfection is the perfection but you'll never know if you got there it's like this it's the same thing as children you're trying to you're trying to do the best you possibly can but you don't know what the best is. Torah. Fine, but you don't have, you don't have a clear. You, you, however, your children turn out, you don't know if they would have been better if you had spent more of this on them, or more of that on them, or less on this. And they, you, you have no idea. We have no idea what they could have been. You know, this is. The, the, it really isn't up to us, right? I mean, isn't that what you taught us last time? Is that like. Yeah. It's 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 inconceivable for us to even figure out what each kid needs and what situation and what issues they should be challenged with, etc. I mean, God knows because God knows who they who are they they're supposed to be and tailors their situation for them. Right, that's so right. We just do the best we can. Right, we have no idea what we're doing. That's how you should think about it. I say that often. <laughs> That's good. Like, we, 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 it's like we give our children a, a, a puzzle, you know, one of those things where they've got to put the shapes in the in the box and everything, right? You follow? And yeah. when they get it done, you know, at first it's difficult and they finally get it. They think they're a genius. Why do they think they're a genius? Because they can't, you, you, a human being cannot imagine a more difficult problem than the ones they've already faced. We can't imagine something more difficult. 
So they, they think they're now a genius and they can solve every problem in the world. Like, what's the problem with making peace in the Middle East? You hear these people all the time saying these things. Like, they should just do this and they should just do that. You follow? Why do they think they know what they're doing? Because they figured out the crossword puzzle this morning. Right? Yeah. New York Times crossword puzzle. And now, now they're a genius. Because a person cannot imagine a more difficult... If, if I can figure out the crossword puzzle, that means I'm the smartest guy around. And therefore, I can solve every problem out there. We can't imagine a problem more difficult than ones we've experienced. So whatever problem you're dealing with can't be more difficult than one I've dealt with. And I solved that one. So I know I'm a smart guy. That's how we think, right? But the reality is a parent gives a child a, a puzzle. There's a fraction of the problems that the parents are facing, right? The Almighty gives us problems that are at in, 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 infinitesimally small fraction of all the problems of existence. Boy, so, that makes you have Anova right there. There's Anova right there, right? We have no idea what we're doing. We can just, if we're lucky, solve the problems I'm sorry, that he gives us. What right there? What was the word you used? Anova, humility. Anova. Humility, okay. We have no idea how to do anything. The Almighty gives us problems that he tailor fits just enough that we can fit a little bit more than we're used to. It pushes our thinking a little bit more. But we have no idea how to do anything. We're complete imbeciles. The universe is so sophisticated. Life is so sophisticated. You can't figure it out. Right? That's our Nava. That's how to live. I never say that or the patients will stop coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do want we do want doctors that have at least a little bit of uh, certainty in their voice. No, a hundred percent. But you see, the, the, the certainty is because this is the best of my understanding. But the anava is the is the winner. If you think it, they'll love you. The patients will love you as he's going to say at the end, right? People who have Anavan, uh, uh, oh, I think we did it already. People who have Anavan, pleasant, they're nice to be with, everyone wants them. Is it the end of the beginning? Um, I feel like you did say something about that before. Maybe I'm misremembering, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. The statement, the quote here from Kedushin, yes. poverty is a matter of Torah, uh, poverty in matters of Torah is an indication of arrogance. Right, that's right. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I like that, but I'm not sure. Uh, is that meaning um, that one who isn't studying Torah uh, is arrogant that he doesn't need or she doesn't need to? Uh, uh, because they know everything, something like that. No, you can have anava without learning Torah. It just says if you if you have arrogance, then for sure you're not you're not learning anything. Okay, okay, got it. It doesn't okay. mean that if you if you don't learn Torah, you ca cannot have humility. You can have humility. I mean, you see that all the time, right? You're going to the cancer ward. You see a lot of people with humility. Going to they the prison. Something is greater than something is great, not greater, not better, but greater has more control over them than themselves. That, that's true, but that's true all the time. Mm -hmm. they don't focus it, focus on it. They think they they because they've solved the latest puzzle, they think they know it, they can solve everything. Well, when Esther solves her first puzzle, you and Ruth get her a little more difficult one. <laughs> okay, very good. Simon goes in the door. We can have Simon Dalaya da Klum Shubuki, right? A Simon, a sign that you don't know anything, is self praise. But Amru Ad, a star begun kish kish. What's the. um? A coin in a jug makes a lot of noise. And when you've got an empty jug, right, you, you shake it around, 
Right, it makes a lot of noise. And there's a guy who's like, it's self praise because there's nothing in there. He doesn't know anything. And you see that with children. When a child uh, learns something, he thinks he's a, he's a big shot. Right, it soon fades when he realizes that you know, it doesn't get him very far. But it's a, they, also, they said also, the fruitless trees will ask, why are your voices heard? The answer is, if only our voices would be heard, then we would be remembered. Right? Because it's talking about trees that make a lot of noise, but they don't have any fruit. They don't achieve anything. And we've already seen that Moshe was selected above all of them because he was the humblest. Right? Why? Because he knew. Why was he the humblest? It's because he, the, the more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know. That that's the that's the secret of Torah. And I've heard it, and I've knocked you, say you hear, I've heard it from Gadolin that they, they feel like they don't know anything. Because the more you know, the more you realize like it's 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 so uh it's so unfathomable. There's so much we don't know. Can I ask a question about like Moshe here? Because you know, he was very humble, but then on the other hand, he was willing to fight with God on behalf of the Jewish people. So help me understand that because I, I don't know, maybe I'm misunderstanding Anava, but I would think that that like if somebody was very humble, it would be hard for them to like fight against, like to fight with God. No, so, you see, mm. so you see, humility, our arrogance is to think about yourself. It, 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 you know, as we said, like you know, when you're when you're uh, self-absorbed, which is equivalent to being, um, you, you know, which happens when people have a, 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 an abundance, they get caught up in themselves, so they <laughs> think something of themselves. That that's the whole problem. Simka Weinberg told me the story that um, uh, Rabbi Akiva Eger, who in his day was the God Lador, there was nobody else other than him. So and he wasn't the only person who had who, who we had this experience with. It's a it's a it's a feature found often with people who are great in Torah, and and explain why. So he um, he applied for the job of janitor. In the local synagogue, and uh, you know they, the soul didn't know what to do. Like, how can you take you know the governor door, the greatest rabbi of the generation, then be the janitor? But on the other hand, they couldn't say no to him. Like, if the governor door calls you up and says, "I want to see you," you got to go see him, right? So they 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 accepted his. They 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 allowed him to do the job. And every community put this shawl in harem, excommunicated them. So you can't have the governor door <laughs> being the chance. They fired him. Right? So he wrote a letter. Uh, Sim has seen the letter. He told me. He, said, he wrote a letter saying, I don't know what I did wrong, but please tell me what I did wrong so I can know how to be a better janitor. Right? Now, this is not an accident of who he was. It, humility is to not is, is you don't you're not there. It's the problem exists. Where do you see this? God forbid, God forbid, God forbid. And you see this all the time. If you've read my book, right? I told the story of Laura Schultz. Thank you. This is the book. Tell the story of Laura Schultz. Laura Schultz was a 63, I think, year old grandmother who picked up the back of a Buick in the day when Buicks were really heavy cars. This is in the 70s. And um, uh, why did she have to do it? Because her grandson was pinned underneath. So there are people who are able to do these kind of things when they see something that needs to be done, they forget about themselves. It's like they channel God. Okay, you can put it like that. So when they when you when you see the 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 the, uh, the emergency, the child is you know on the burning building, or the kid that falls on the tracks in front of a train, people just do. They don't think about who I am or what I've got to do. They just do. 
people in the army have this experience, right? And under fire, you forget about yourself. So humility is like not to think about yourself. They saw the emergency, the crisis at hand, and when you when you when you're like that, you take on God. So basically, you're saying he was simply doing the job that God had created him for. And in this specific circumstance, it was to fight with God. That's right. Exactly. Wow. That's a brain twister. That's, no, but, it, but it was a very good question to ask. And, uh, but then what about uh, Avraham Avinu, who... Also, who are the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. When you when you don't think about yourself, you just see the problem at hand. You can do incredible things. We've all we've all been there. We see an emergency, a crisis, uh, uh, whatever happens to be, and we've got to just do whatever needs to be done. We don't think about ourselves. We just do it. But a lot of people despair of what they see because they can't figure out what to do. Right, but, but that's because you get caught up in yourself. Thinking, I don't know what to do. I don't know right. what to do. Rather right. than, what's the problem? What could be a possible solution? Right. Has anyone dealt with something similar? What would they say? What advice can I get? So you're not you're focused on the problem rather than, oh, what can I do? I might get hurt. What's that? Humility is always associated with Moshe, but I'm trying to remember if I've ever heard it associated with Avraham. No, well, it, it just is that Moshe was the most humble, not that he was the only one. I'll yeah. tell you a story. When I was in Yeshiva, I mean, thank God I had this experience. It, it, it's You can't uh, put a price on it. But there was a rabbi, my Ramir Shusa, they wrote a book about him called A Tap on the Shoulder. And he, they did a movie about him. You can look it up. Phenomenal. Mind-boggling. He used to go down to the hotel and tap people on the shoulder and bring them into Asia Tor and other yeshivas as well. He must have brought in thousands of kids. Thousands of kids. He was the most unassuming, humble, non-charismatic uh, person you could ever imagine. Words, if we were to do a lineup of a hundred million people and go, who's the guy who's going to be best be able to talk to people? Like t t convincing young men to try a yeshiva, right, who are 19, 20, 21, 22, in that age range, to try a yeshiva instead of going off to some, you know, hippie kibbutz somewhere, is got a, is real mastery of you know communication skills. The guy had no lines whatsoever, nothing. He was just tapping. Would you like to come to yeshiva? What's a yeshiva? It's a place where you learn about God and Torah and things like that. And he had, and he had like five lines, and that was it, right? And people were bring people in. But I'll tell you, I think it was Rabbi Platnik. A few people will tell the story, right? That um, he was just, he just, you'd ask him, how do you do this? He says, I can see the crisis. These kids are going to go off and they're going to disappear and they're going to marry out. And I've got to save them. But it's like, if you if you saw a kid, like, you know, let's say you're, you're in uh, England and, you you know, you see an 18-year-old kid getting on a train going back to Berlin, Germany, and it's 1938. And you know what's going to happen. Like, wouldn't you like to do your best to convince them not to go? Right? That's what it was like for him. So I tell you, this was a very common occurrence. He taps a guy on the shoulder. You know, would you like to come to your shoe? I've heard Shalom Schwartz is also one of those guys. You can look him up. It's an incredible story. So he taps him on the shoulder. And he says, would you like to come? He says, what's the yeshiva? It tells him, no, I'm not interested. Thank you very much. He says, why not? He says, I'm not interested. <laughs> Give it a shot. Try it. Why don't you try it? You've got to be open-minded. Yeah, I know, but I'm just not really interested. It's not my cup of tea. And he goes on and on and on. And the guy's <laughs> like, he says, listen, I've got to go catch my bus. Right? And it's over there. Uh, you know, I'll, next time I'm in town, 
Maybe we can catch up, blah, blah, blah. He says, but you should come to Yeshiva. I, I'm not interested. I've got to go now. Yeah, but come to the Yeshiva. And he walks with them all the way to the bus stop. Right? The guy gets on the bus, but Mir Shuster gets on the bus with him. <laughs> he says, what are you doing? He says, I'm trying to convince you to come. You should try it. It's really good. That's all he says. Right? If I, they, get to, they get to the guy's kibbutz. He's got to change buses. He goes all the way to the kibbutz, somewhere up north somewhere. <laughs> Right, guess the, <laughs> the guy goes, Yeah, the guy is sitting with him the whole time. He sits with him. This is a true story. This happened not once. This happened many, many times. He goes into his dorm. Right, is that talking to him? The guy finally says, "Listen, I'll do you. I tell you what, I'll make you a deal. If I come with you to the yeshiva for one day, will you leave me alone? Promise to leave me alone." <laughs> he says, "Yes." <laughs> the rest is history. That's another. And I'm so glad that you went with him. Uh, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't me. But he said, that's another. I don't count. It's the is then I don't count. It's like if it's your kid, you gotta do whatever it takes. I don't count. Right? That's how that's how we gotta be. I don't count. It's whatever needs to be done. That's another. It's almost like you have to have the persistence to do God's work, I right? Do. Like it's, it's like, is that, is that, because like, that's one of the things that I teach in my verbal assertiveness class. The first thing is persistence. Like without the persistence, that's it. Poof. Like all, all goals, all interests, everything, just because you can easily be manipulated by the Sahara, by others. It doesn't matter. It just goes poof. If you're not persistent, you're not and persistent. that's what he was. He was persistent to the point that people were like, I'm not going to get rid of him unless I give him what he wants, <laughs> and then he'll let me go. Yeah, right. He just kept going because he saw he saw the need. He couldn't let these kids go. He saw the need. He, he, loved, he loved Hashem, and he's not going to let, let his kids go to waste, go to, to, go, go to, go to pot. Good. Are there still yeah. are there still guys from Aish who do that sort of gear off? There's a guy on the coattail. His name is um he's a great guy. His name escapes me. Um he's a, he, every Friday night you can ca catch him there. He's a he used to work with Mayor Schuster. Um I don't remember his name. <laughs> It'll come to as soon as I get off the call. Does he just go for the young guys to draw them into the yeshiva? How about old guys like me? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he does. I don't know. You'll have to ask him. When you go to the cocktail next, you'll, you'll see him. He wears these uh, Soon, interesting hopefully. shoes. He's bored. Um, see, what... we've got something in common. Yeah, no, great guy. Great guy. He wears what shoes? What? He wears these very fancy. Uh, they're, they're called. Um, they have a name. Uh, sailboat shoes or something. I forget what they're called. Oh, I can picture his face right in front of me, and um, lovely guy. Big It'll stuff. come to you in the middle of the night. I know. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye, -bye.